Good Sunday morning to you. Getting started just a minute or so early this morning. Uh, no point in sitting around waiting. Glad that you're tuning in with us this morning. Hope that your Lord's Day is getting off to a good start. Uh, here in uh, Beaver Creek, Ohio, it is a cold and drizzly morning with the promise of rain all day today. Uh, but we will survive that just fine. I uh, want to remind you that we'll be back on here Wednesday at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. We are going to resume our study of the book of Philippians, and we'll be in chapter 2. Starting chapter 2, that's a, an excellent chapter in that very practical and very good book that we're involved in studying. So uh, I encourage you to be back with us on Wednesday at 7 o'clock Eastern. I hope you have your Bible out this morning. We're going to take a look at a number of passages uh, to consider what the Bible has to tell us about the subject of death. I know this is not the most encouraging subject for us to be talking about this morning, uh, and it's not one that was requested either. Uh, we're talking about this this morning because Wednesday night, as we were studying Philippians in chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul says, at, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we talked about his attitude towards death. And I got several good uh, comments and, and feedback from the members here at Knollwood about that discussion about Paul's attitude towards death. And I got to thinking, uh, perhaps this would be something that would be worth our while to spend a little more time looking into. Uh, I put a post yesterday uh, announcing the topic, the subject for uh, this morning, and got a number of individuals uh, who said they were looking forward to the study. So we're going to take a look at what the Bible has to tell us about the Christian's perspective, or the, or the Bible's perspective on the subject of death. Before we get started with our study, as we always do, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the night's rest and this new day that you have given us, this Lord's Day that we have, a day that you have set aside for us to, to worship you and for us to spend in, in, in communing with you. We pray that you would be with us as we study your word this hour, that you would help us to understand what your word teaches, that we would understand the truth regarding this subject. Pray that we would apply it to our lives and we'd be able to teach it unto others. We pray for those who are sick, those who are recovering, those who are in harm's way, that you would bless them, those who are mourning and grieving. We pray that you would comfort them as only you can. Forgive us of our sins as we repent and turn from them. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Death is a common experience to mankind. We're all going to face it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27 says, it is appointed unto man once to die. But even though it's a common experience and it's all around us, it seems as if there are daily reminders of this subject, we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to talk about death. Uh, for one thing, death is painful. It hurts us deeply to lose a loved one. We know that death is permanent. It is a one-way door. There is no coming back from death. And death is perplexing. As we don't know exactly what happens to us at death. Oh, we, we can go to the Bible and we can see what, what we're told. But there are some things about death that you and I both know we're not going to know. We're not going to understand until we experience it personally. It can be very unsettling to us to hear someone talking about their death in a positive or in a welcoming way, can't it? We, as, as humans here in this world, we have a survival mentality. We're going to see this through to the very end. We are going to live. We are going to survive. And so to hear someone talking about death as if they are welcoming it, they're wanting it, that's very upsetting to us. That can be very troubling to us 
and that with that being the case, what do we do with some scriptures in the Bible that present death in a positive way? In the book of Psalms, at Psalm 116 and verse 15, we read, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Since when is the death of a good person a precious thing? In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, and this is a verse we're going to look at a, a number of times in our study this morning. Revelation 14 and verse 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are the dead. How can that be? And then, of course, uh, from our study Wednesday night, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for to, die, to live is Christ and to die is gain. How is death gain? Death is the one thing that we want to avoid, that we want to stay away from. Two verses later, Paul says that it's better for him to die. These can be some very troubling passages of Scripture. Uh, are you sure we have the right attitude towards death? Did, did God get this right? Do we have it right? What's going on here? There are some things that you and I can know about death. We know that death is a reality. We don't have to get very far in the Bible before we see this. Death is promised in the second chapter of the Bible. Death is delivered in the third chapter of the Bible. And the first death occurs in the fourth chapter of the Bible. So death is a reality that we hit very early in the Bible, and it's a reality that we all face. That, that's a part of a child losing their innocence is the first time they, they lose a loved one, and they have to, to deal with what death is all about. That's a part of the loss of that innocence of childhood. We also know what death is. Death is a separation. James chapter 2 and verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. A person dies when their spirit leaves their physical body. But there are some things about death that we don't know. And it's what we don't know that's troubling to us. Like, when am I going to die? We don't get to make that call. That's, that's a decision that lies outside uh, of our realm of choice. But when's it going to happen? How am I going to die? I remember when I first started preaching full time in Macon, Missouri, there was a member there named Denny White. And oftentimes in his public prayers in our assemblies, he would include a request that that God would grant each of us when it's time for us to leave this earth. He would grant us a peaceful hour in which to pass. And I remember as a, a 23, 24 year old, that, that sounded a little bit strange. It doesn't sound so strange anymore. How are we going to die? When are we going to die? We don't know. You know, one of the many, many blessings that we have in the Bible is that God in his word has revealed some information to us about death. Now, listen to me. The Bible does not answer every possible question about the subject of death, but the Bible does give us the information that we need to face and to deal with the reality of death and not just the death of others, but even our own death. I want us to take some time this morning to look at the subject of death from a biblical perspective. I want to look at four ways the Bible tells us we need to look upon the subject of death. Four ways. Now, there are, there are others, but I've chosen these four. The first one, the Bible tells us, or the Bible describes death as sleep. In the book of Acts, chapter 7 and verse 60, whenever the angry mob stones Stephen to death, the very last phrase in that chapter says that he fell asleep. 
Now, that doesn't mean that he decided that he got it tired from of the beating and he passed out. No, two verses later, they're burying him. He died. But the Bible says that he fell asleep. The word sleep was a common metaphor for death. It was used by the Greeks and by the Romans and even by the Jews. And the reason for this use should be obvious to us. A, a person who is dead resembles someone who is sleeping. In our culture today, when we have, have a death and we go to the, the funeral home, we see the, the deceased laid out in a casket and they look like they're sleeping. And so it's, it's a natural metaphor for the Bible to use, but there's more to it than just the appearance of the one who has passed away. Uh, describing death as sleep is much deeper and more meaningful than just the way the deceased appears. Turn with me to Mark chapter five. Mark chapter 5, we're going to turn there in a moment. I want you to read this passage with me. Before I do, though, I want to read a quote from uh, Walton Weaver's commentary on the book of 1 Thessalonians about this, this use of the word sleep to refer to death. And it's not a quote that belongs to Brother Weaver, but he took it from another source. But I want to read this to you. This metaphorical use of the word sleep is appropriate because of the similarity in appearance between a sleeping body and a dead body. Restfulness and peace normally characterize both. The object of the metaphor is to suggest that as the sleeper does not cease to exist while his body sleeps, so the dead person continues to exist despite his absence from the region in which those who remain can communicate with him. That is, as sleep is known to be temporary, so the death of the body will be found to be. Sleep has its waking, death will have its resurrection. When a person is asleep, they don't cease to exist. When a person has died, they don't cease to exist. Just like that nap will be over, Death one day will be over as well. Jesus referred to individuals who were dead as sleeping two times. And both times he did were occasions when he raised them from the dead. In Mark chapter 5, a, a, a man comes to get Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter before she dies. On the way there, he gets word that she has died. Jesus says, don't fear, and they keep going to the house. When they enter in, Jesus sees all the people there. There's a tumult in those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep, verse 39. The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him for saying this, that Jesus sent them all out of the house. He took the mother and the father, Peter, James, and John, and went in, and he raised the girl from the dead. Indeed, she was just sleeping. The second time is in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. His friend has died, but notice how he mentions this to his 12 disciples in John chapter 11, starting at verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Isn't that interesting? The two times that Jesus uses the metaphor of sleep to refer to death are the two times that he goes to raise someone from the dead. So when the Bible describes death as sleep, what is being emphasized is the fact that it's temporary and we will wake from it one day. Paul uses this metaphor in two different chapters in the New Testament. 
Both of them are places where Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and this is the Bible's chapter on the subject of the resurrection. In this great chapter, we're not going to read it, and there's 58 verses there. But four times in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, verse 18, verse 20, and verse 51, Paul mentions those who are dead, refers to them as being asleep. And the second chapter is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And would you turn there with me? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is another place where the Apostle Paul is teaching on the subject of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 is the entire section. But let's start at verse 13 and read down uh, through verse 16. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. He's mentioned it three times in three verses. Who are these individuals who are asleep? Well, if we haven't figured it out by now, verse 16 makes it clear. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The Lord taught and his apostles taught that death for a Christian is sleep. Now, the sleep that's referred to, I want to make this comment before we move on. The sleep that is referred to here is talking about the physical body. The soul of man does not sleep after death. The scriptures make it clear that those who are dead are very conscious of their surroundings and their state in the spiritual realm. But the physical body, it's asleep. It's not permanent. It will wake up on that great resurrection day. There's a second way the Bible tells us we need to view death and understand death. It's very much related to sleep, and that is the idea of rest. Rest. Uh, we saw this in Revelation uh, chapter 14 and at verse 13. I'll read it again. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Death is the perfect and ultimate rest. Jesus promises rest to those who will come to him. In Matthew chapter 11, he extends the great invitation. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest that Jesus offers to us is a rest from the traditions of men, a rest from sin, a rest from error. That list could go on, but it is not a rest from toil. And it's not a rest from suffering. The very next verse, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You don't yoke an animal to send it to bed. You yoke an animal to put it to work. We've got work to do as Christians. And just a couple of chapters over uh, in chapter 16, a couple of pages in my Bible, uh, Matthew 16, verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To take up the cross means to share in the suffering of Christ. So coming to Jesus doesn't mean that we're going to have rest from everything. No, we continue to serve, we continue to toil, we continue to undergo hardships, and we continue to undergo the sufferings of life and even the sufferings of being a Christian until our death. It is at death that we have true rest. Job understood this. 
you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Job, uh, the book of Job is an interesting book uh, to read, to consider what Job understood about death and about life after death. Chronologically speaking, Job was one of the earliest books in the Bible. Job would have lived during the time of Abraham. Abraham's life is recorded in the book of Genesis. We know that as God continued to reveal his will to man, that by the time we get to the New Testament, we have a much better understanding of death and life after death than the patriarchs of old did. But through the book of Job, there are some glimpses of Job having some understanding of what lied in death and what lied beyond death. In Job chapter 3, as Job is suffering terribly and beginning to regret that he has life, wishing that he had died when he was born, he says this in verses 17 through 19. This is Job chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. There, that is in the grave, in death, there the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. The pris there the prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Those blessings that are found in death, according to Job, is a, a rest from the terrible things that that we experience in this world and in this life. But, but notice, that rest isn't found until we are there in death. Uh, a verse that has brought great comfort, great comfort to many people, Revelation chapter 21 and verse four, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When is it that you and I are going to have rest from, from sorrow and crying and pain? On the other side of death. In Luke chapter 16, talking about the rich man, and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16 and at verse 25, when the rich man asked for Abraham to send Lazarus over to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue, Lazarus, uh, the rich man rather, was reminded that, that he had his good things in life and Lazarus, he had his sufferings. And now the rich man was being tormented and Lazarus was being comforted. It was after death that he experienced his comfort. So, a second way the Bible would have us to understand death is that death is a rest for us. There's a third thing I want to consider. Uh, let's turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And here, we're going to dig for it, but we're going to find that the New Testament tells us that death is the way that you and I get home. Death is a homecoming for the faithful. The book of 2 Corinthians at chapter 5, let's read verses 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we should not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul in this passage speaks of death as one would be folding up a tent and going to a place of permanent 
abode, going into a house, to dwell in a house. The physical body is described in this passage as a tent, or I think the King James Version uses the word tabernacle. Peter also describes his death as putting off this tent in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. What is it about, about the, the body that would cause these inspired men to refer to it as a tent? Well, the physical body is very tent-like in that it is frail. It is temporary. It's easily folded up and discarded and set aside for something that is more desirable and something that is more permanent. That describes perfectly what's going to happen to us at the resurrection. Now stay here, keep your place here in 2 Corinthians 5 and turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Remember, this is the great chapter on the resurrection. I want to read verses 42 through 44, where Paul anticipates the question, what's the resurrected body going to be like? He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. We don't know everything about what we're going to be like when we rise from the dead. John makes this clear in 1 John chapter 3. But we're given some, some clues here. We're given some information here. Uh, we know that this physical body is like a tent. It is corruptible. It breaks down. It, it has wear and tear. Uh, it suffers pain and injury. Uh, we know that that body that we'll have after the resurrection is just the opposite. And as, as people grow older, there are a lot of aches and pains that come with age. And I've, I've talked to many an aged Christian who's tired of this physical body. Their tent is wearing out and they long for what God has in store for them. I want us to look at verse six. And I want us to see something that Paul says here. And his point should be obvious to us, but Maybe we have to dig a little bit to, to see it and appreciate it. He says in verse six, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then in verse eight, we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That word home used in verse 6, is translated from a Greek word that means to be among one's own people, to dwell in one's own country. While we as Christians are here in this world, in this physical life, we are away from our people. We are away from our home. What Paul is saying right here in this text is, I want to go home. I want to go home. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. We know that Christians are strangers and pilgrims and foreigners here in this world. Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our home is. That's where our people are. That's where we long to be. But we're not going to see it until death. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. See, Paul here mentions again about the change that will take place in our bodies when we go home. This old tent will be laid aside and we'll get to go home with the Lord. At funerals, 
of Christians who have passed away. It's an appropriate time for us to mourn. It's an appropriate time for us to express grief and sorrow. And I encourage that because that's a part of the process of, of, of mourning a loss and being able to move on from the loss of a loved one. That's important. But we need to remember also that for a, a Christian who has died in the Lord, their death is their homecoming. They're getting to go home. And they're rejoicing in that. And that's why the Lord would say, precious is the death of his saints. Let's look at one more thing. One more thing. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. I want you to see this passage with me. Mark chapter 9. And here the Lord himself tells us that death is actually life. Death is actually life. The Christian life is full of paradoxes. And a paradox is a statement that appears to be contradictory. A statement that appears to contradict what we understand to be true. And as I said, Christianity is full of these things. Uh, the person who would be first shall be last. Those who are last shall be first. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? The greatest in the kingdom is the lowest ranking person in the kingdom, the servant. He who would save his life would lose it. He who would lose his life for my sake in the gospels will find it, Jesus says. But here again is another paradox. It's, it's somewhat veiled, not as obvious as these others that I've mentioned. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I read this passage in Mark and I didn't see what Jesus said, but but I, I, I want to show it to you here. It's very important that we get this. Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 48. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Oftentimes when I go to this passage, I would focus upon the punishment that would come to the one who's not practicing self-control and self-denial. This passage isn't Jesus teaching us to mutilate our bodies. He's teaching us the necessity of practicing self control. Act like you don't have an eye, like you don't have a hand, like you don't have a foot. Because if you follow after the lust that come through these avenues and are pursued by these things, you're going to suffer eternally. We have a great description of hell here where, where the fire is not quenched. The worm does not die. The fire is not quenched. Hell is a place where there's that eternal pain, that eternal suffering. Hell is a place where there is, you're in the presence of continual death and corruption. And we focus on that side of it because that's where a lot of the description is found. But did you notice what Jesus said was on the other side of that equation? First two times, he said life. Life. And and he says, not that you'll lose life, you, 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 you risk losing life. He says, you have yet to enter life. In John chapter 3 and verse 13, Jesus says that he has come down from heaven. From our perspective here on earth, we have life right now. And this physical life will last until 
death, and death will be the end of life. Jesus has come from heaven, and it's as if he is saying, you don't understand. Life isn't here. Life doesn't begin until you get there. That's where life is found. But the only way that you and I obtain that, enter into that, is by tasting physical death here. We stand the risk of losing that life if we don't practice the self-control, if we don't live the way the gospel tells us to, hell will be our eternal fate. But heaven, that's where life really, really begins. You and I were not created to live apart from God in the presence of sin. And that's what we have here and now. This isn't what we were created for. This isn't life. Life is living in face-to-face -face fellowship with our creator. That's what life is. And that life will be found when this life is over. The Bible reveals other things about death to us. And as we study the scriptures, we can see those things. I've chosen these four, and I've wanted us to focus on these four this morning. From our study of scripture, we can see the proper perspective for you and I to have upon death. Death is seen, number one, as a sleep from which we will all awake. It's seen, number two, as a rest, a final rest from everything that troubles us here in this world. It's seen as a homecoming. We're finally, finally getting to go home to be with the Lord. And death, really, that's where life truly begins. And I want to make this statement before we end our study this morning. These blessings, these descriptions of death that are blessings, are only for those who are in the Lord. I'll read one last time, Revelation 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. If you're not in the Lord, if you're not a faithful Christian, then these descriptions about death do not apply to you. But they can. They can if you would be in the Lord. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You must repent of your sins. And upon confessing your faith, you must be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Galatians 3 verse 27 says that we are baptized into Christ. Those who die in that state, in the Lord, are those who will enter into their sleep and their rest, who will go home, who will enter into life. If you're not in the Lord, you need to be. And if you'd like to learn more about that, or would like to study with me about that, then private message me. That's what I would love to do with my time, is to help you to understand what you have to do to be in the Lord. If you are a Christian, live with that confidence and that hope that God gives you through the scriptures, understanding exactly what death is meant to be for you and for me. Do we not serve a great God who is able to take the worst thing that we experience here in this world and turn it into something as beautiful as sleep and rest and life and going home? Think about these things. Honey, I'll be home in a couple of minutes and I'll see the rest of you on Wednesday night. I hope you have. 